All right, so I'd like to introduce our speaker today. Uh, this is Dr. Uh, Sinead Mihain. Uh, yay, all right, I've been practicing it. Uh, she did, she uh, grew up on the uh, west coast of Ireland and then uh, made her way to uh, for her undergraduate uh, at uh, the University of Scranton. Uh, from there, she did her PhD at University of Delaware and uh, has is now an associate professor here at the University of South Alabama. Uh, she's going to be talking to us uh, today. Um, she, you know, uh, a lot of her work has been in uh, microbiology, but also molecular microbiology in the marine uh, setting, of course. And uh, but also has uh, done a great, um, you know, uh, work with undergraduate and uh, and as well as graduate students as well. And so, uh, well, uh, what she's going to be talking to us about is a confluence of uh, both research and uh, incorporating uh, undergraduates into uh, into that research program. All right, thank you very much. Okay, well, so can everybody hear me okay, hopefully? Seems we start all seminars now with uh, this question. So I want to thank Brandy and everyone uh, for the invitation to come down and talk a little bit about what I've, we've been doing in my lab in recent years. And I thought given that um, Marine Sciences is about to jump, you know, with both feet into the world of undergraduate education, that I would talk a little bit about integrating authentic research experiences into an undergraduate curriculum. And so focus on what undergrads in my courses have been doing. And maybe if there's time at the end, talk about how some of that can translate into the research that we're doing in my lab that's been, been being done by graduate students. And so I'm gonna start off with why, like I made the decision to try and pull real authentic research experiences into the undergraduate curriculum. And so these are some data from the 2022 National Science Board Science and Engineering Indicators Survey it was just released this past week. But what it's showing is the science and engineering degree recipients in the United States in 2019. And so this top graph here just gives us the breakdown of the US population. So the college age kind of cohort age 20 to 34 years with blacks or African-Americans here in blue, Hispanic or Latino students in, in red, right, and so on. And what we can see as we progress through the different levels of post-secondary education from associate degree recipients to bachelor's degree recipients, to master's degree recipients, to doctoral degree recipients, that um, we have a problem with representation in the sciences where um, we have Blacks and um, Hispanics and American Indians, Alaskan Natives, and basically um, being underrepresented in the sciences. And this is a real problem in terms of having a diverse uh, workforce, carrying out science. And I think we've seen over the last, uh, two, two and a half years during the COVID pandemic that kind of a lack of science literacy perhaps across the population has been a big contributor to things like vaccine hesitancy. And so one of the things that I'm trying to do in my teaching, right, is to broaden participation in science in the classroom. And so we've got here the data for the U.S. as a whole, okay, and this problem with diminished representation of uh, underrepresented minority groups, also of uh, women in the sciences has been referred to as a uh, pipeline problem, right? We've got some data here looking at degrees in chemistry where um, we're looking at just as students who are black, we see that, you know, we've got pretty good representation of black students in the first year college population. But as we go over time, by the time we look at postdocs who are black or profess chemistry professors who are black at top 50 schools, we've really narrowed this pipeline where we've lost a lot of those people who were originally interested in chemistry. And similar trends when we look at, um, at women. And so, um, so this next slide here, let me just see a minute if I can hide this uh, thing. All right, all right. Okay, so what I've got here now is 
data from the University of South Alabama, right? We're in Alabama, and I thought it would be interesting to share some data looking just at biology majors at the University of South Alabama. And this is work that was done by Angela Google and Jeremiah Henning in the biology department, where they've been looking a lot at retention and in, um, in the sciences in general. And so we've gotten this graph here is we're looking at the 2015 biology major cohort. Okay. And so we've broken it down. The blue bars are the students who declared a biology major in fall of 2015. Uh, just in percentages, the whole, which we had 117 entering biology majors in fall of 2015. And in the orange bars are the students, the percentage who graduated with a degree in biology four years later. And so you can see in our um, Asian uh, American population, we actually do pretty okay. We actually increased representation of Asian students, right? Uh, but we have a huge attrition in our uh, African-American or Black students who um, they come in as biology majors, but they comprise a much smaller proportion of our graduating students. Uh, the Caucasians increase in abundance, make up for the loss in these other groups. And then our kind of, uh, Hispanic and mixed race students, the numbers are almost too small to quantify. Okay, uh, looking at the data broken down by sex, we see that actually we, uh, the proportion of women graduating with a degree in biology actually increases from the declared majors. Uh, and so we don't seem to have as much of a problem there maybe, but that may be a, an artifact in that our majors in general, we have a much higher number of female students. Okay, but overall you look at you know, retention of biology majors at the University of South Alabama. And it's, these are depressing data to look at, right? We bring in 117 majors every fall, say, we lose about half of them in the first year. And some of these are lost to other, other majors. Some are just students who don't come back for their sophomore year, where it's not specifically a biology problem. It's um, just the nature of the student population at South. But over a four year period, when we'd be expecting our students to graduate of those 117 who entered as biology majors, 26 graduate with a degree in biology in four years. So in biology, and the numbers are similar in the other sciences at South, we have a 21% say four year graduation rate for our sciences. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that South is practically an open admission school. And so the four-year graduation rate for this cohort in general across the university was 28%. So it's bad, but it's not necessarily solely a biology problem. Um, the six-year graduation rate for this group is 47%. So part of these numbers, probably the fact that our, a lot of our students are not traditional four-year students, they're taking longer to get their degrees, their working jobs and just accruing credits more slowly than students who go to more selective institutions. But the question to me when we think, when I saw these data and we're thinking about them, were what can we do to improve retention, um, especially of our, the underrepresented groups that we're losing at a disproportionate rate, but in the biology major as a whole. And so there's been a lot of work done on um, strategies that one can employ to improve retention in the sciences, right? And these, a lot of these are institutional efforts, things like tracking and increasing awareness of institutional progress towards diversity STEM, towards um, improving retention, things like creating strategic partnerships across the university and with external organizations to connect students with possible career tracks, um, during their, um, during their studies. Um, one that I'll focus most of my seminar on is building authentic research experiences into the curriculum, developing these course-based undergraduate research experiences or cure courses, um, just employ you know, 
resources, allocate resources to ad address student resource disparities, and then making curricular connections, service learning opportunities, and so on. And so I'm gonna focus, like I said, on talking about what I've done in the microbiology part of the biology curriculum at South um, to try and build these authentic research experiences that have been shown to increase retention and engagement in, a, in the sciences. And so I've done this in two courses that I teach regularly. The first course is a course called Molecular Microbiology. It's a general microbiology survey course. Many of you who are undergrads in biology probably took this kind of course, lecture and lab a mountain of information to assimilate in 15 short weeks, and lots of experiments done on things like E. coli, micrococcus, and staph, and so on. So it's a lecture and lab course, and it's also one of our writing intensive courses at South, where uh, students have to do at least three 12 to 1500 word writing assignments over the semester. And so I've done in this class is turn the lab into a semester-long guided research project where the students isolate pH degrading bacteria. Rather than work with known lab rat bacteria, they start off by isolating these bacteria and then characterizing them. And so I generally teach this class every fall and I follow it up in the spring with an experimental bacterial genomics class where we take some of these isolates and the students design experiments, independent research projects to identify particular genes of interest. Okay, so the basic course plan for the research aspect of three, Biology 314 is that the students over the course of the semester isolate, characterize, and identify naphthalene degrading bacteria. And as they're doing this work for the writing component of the course, we couple these experiments to guided reading and discussion of primary research articles describing similar work. And then at the end of the semester, we have a poster session where the students present their work to the department and anyone else I can convince to come visit and uh, eat cookies and talk science. Okay. And so we focus on uh, naphthalene degrading bacteria. There's a couple of reasons for this. Uh, so it's a polyaromatic hydrocarbon. These are persistent pollutants, right? Um, but from my perspective, the reason that we work with these bacteria is because there's an easy colorimetric assay that we can use to identify these bacteria. Where if we add indole to auger plates, naphthalene degrading bacteria will turn this beautiful blue color. And so you can tell just by looking at them without doing any, you know, stinky chemistry that you have what you're looking for. And then two, there's just the ecological relevance, right? We live, it's a, we're more than a decade on from the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, but the memory of that still lives among people along the Gulf Coast. There's always the threat of another spill. And so it's a topic in which students are interested. Way more interested, I learned, than in isolating bacteria that can degrade cellulose. The pH is one big time in that uh, comparison. Okay. So I already said, these polyaromatic hydrocarbons are persistent pollutants, right? They cause adverse uh, health conditions, but the good news is there are a lot of bacteria that can degrade them. So bioremediation by these bacteria is one removal strategy. We work with the simplest of the polyaromatic hydrocarbons, naphthalene, the simple two-ring structure, right? You can buy it at Walmart, as mothballs. Uh, EPA has listed a lot of these higher, uh, higher molecular weight uh, PAHs as priority pollutants. Okay, and so this is a well-described system which makes it really good for using an undergraduate microbiology class. The biochemistry of pH degradation is well understood, right? Whether we're looking at monoaromatic hydrocarbons or polyaromatic hydrocarbons, the first step in aerobic degradation is addition of one or both um, atoms of molecular oxygen across one of these carbon-carbon double bonds to destroy the aromaticity of the ring so that it can be further degraded. And these are ultimately degraded to compounds that can enter the, uh, 
the TCA cycle. They enter central metabolism, and so they can serve as carbon and energy sources for the bacteria. But then this blue color, the oxygenase enzymes that catalyze this first step in degradation will also take indole and convert it to indigo, which produces this beautiful blue color. Occasionally, if you're lucky, purple, black, or even pink as well. And so uh, this slide here, we've got 10 weeks of the microbiology semester on one slide, right? Uh, students, uh, I have them bring in soil samples from around Mobile or water samples if they live, you know, by a lake or a pond or down here on the beach. And we set up enrichment cultures where we provide naphthalene as the sole carbon and energy source. We let those grow up for a few days, then they get to do a little bit of you know, math, do some dilution series, plate these dilutions out on auger plates in which we've included indole to um, identify the pH degraders when it's converted to indigo. They do streak plates until they've got a pure culture. Right? And then we do basically, we work our way through the recommended skills that they should be learning in introductory microbiology class. And so we do some staining and microscopy. We've got an example here of a nice gram stain that one student performed. Right? We do a rake of biochemical tests, carbon source utilizations, fermentation tests, catalase tests, oxidase tests, the things you would have done in a classic microbiology lab when your instructor gives you your tube of an unknown bacterium to identify. But here, instead of working towards the correct answer, we're just working towards an answer, learning as much as we can about our uh, pest naphthalene degraders. Okay, then we work in a little bit of uh, molecular uh, skills as well. The students PCR amplify two uh, target genes from, uh, from their isolates. The first is the 16S ribosomal RNA gene. We send those PCR products out to be sequenced so that they can identify their bacteria. And then we also look for this PAHE gene. So this is a gene that's involved in about the fifth, codes for the fifth enzyme in the degradation pathway of PAHs. And so we do, you know, some phylogenetic uh, identification, if you will, with the 16S. And we try to do a little bit of functional characterization, identify one of the genes involved in the degradation pathway. And so this gel here, we're seeing the results of the 16S, which always works right because bacteria have to make proteins, so they have to have this gene. And then this panel below is the results of one of their PHE uh, amplifications, where we've got some check marks, some question marks. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. This isn't surprising. Protein coding genes tend to be a lot more heterogeneous in their sequence. You don't always get what you're looking for when you do a PCR for a functional gene. And this is a good lesson to learn because we're often, in, as undergrads, focused on getting things right, right? There's a right answer. You've got to get the right answer. And we're really, not just undergrads, people in general, right? We're uncomfortable with ambiguity or, we, you know, and so this is actually kind of fun to do. These we don't sequence, we just score the gene as presence, present or absent. It'd be a little bit too much work. We'd have to clone these before we could sequence them. And there's just not time in the semester. And then the last thing we do, which is a late addition to the more recent iterations of these classes, is we, um, we look at the antimicrobial resistance profile of these bacteria. And I'll explain in a minute why we, uh, why we do that. Okay. So I've done the course in this uh, format for uh, five years now, although two of those were during COVID times, right? So I had some students come to lab and do the lab and some, uh, some uh, do the lab virtually. But over the course of those five years, we've isolated, I think it's 160 uh, naphthalene degrading bacteria. Each student isolates their own pet microbe. Um, and so, we call them naphthalene degrading bacteria because they can grow on auger plates that contain naphthalene as the only source of carbon and energy. And if they produce the blue color as well, we're fairly confident that they're um, naphthalene degraders. 
And so what kind of bacteria did we find? Um, they're mostly gram-negative bacteria, okay? And this pie chart shows the uh, breakdown at the genus level of what we found. Surprisingly, uh, the areas we've sampled, we've isolated a lot of um, Acinetobacter. Half our culture collection are Acinetobacter. Then the next most populous uh, group are the Borkholderia, <coughs> which are known pH degraders, PCB degraders. A decent slice of our pie is unknown. These are sequencing reactions that failed, <coughs> which is you know, if you don't have a pure culture, which sometimes in an undergrad lab, 10 weeks isn't enough time to get a beautiful pure culture. Uh, so we have some unknowns. Uh, we've got Pseudomonas, another well-known xenobiotic uh, degrading genus. And then um, a number of others in here, okay? Uh, and just a small fraction, fewer than 10% of the bacteria that we've isolated are gram-positive bacteria. Uh, when we look at the uh, screening for this pH degradation gene, the PHE gene, we find that about 50% of our um, isolates contain this gene. And so what that tells us is that they contain a pH degradation pathway that's similar to previously characterized degradation pathways. Um, and that these others, the primers we chose didn't work to amplify that gene. It doesn't mean the gene's not there. It just means it's different enough that we weren't able to detect it, or maybe they're using a different degradation pathway. Okay. And so the finding that we had a lot of Acinetobacter was an intriguing one because this genus is much better known as an emerging gram-negative pathogen than it is as a degrader of polyaromatic hydrocarbons. There are a couple of papers that report on it as a pH degrader, uh, but much more on how it can kill you if you're in hospital. Right? And so one of my students from fall of 2020, Anna Foster, um, at the end of the semester, she emailed me and asked me if she could do a follow-up directed studies or independent research project in my lab which was really um, gratifying because she had taken, because of COVID, she had taken the entire class virtually. I had never seen her in person, but she emailed me and was like, you know, I really loved the class. I loved lab, which was kind of strange because you've never actually been in lab. And, and she was intrigued by the fact that we found all these, you know, allegedly pathogenic bacteria in our pH degrading collection. And so she came to the lab and she worked on um, characterizing the antimicrobial resistance of these um, bacteria, because one of the reasons that these acinetobacters are uh, pathogens of concern is because they tend to be resistant to a wide variety of antibiotics. They're hard to treat when you get an infection with them. And so she, when she was preparing her poster, had found this out. And she wanted to come and see if our acinetobacters were resistant to antimicrobials. And so here we've got one of the bacteria that she worked with, NP404. And she did this assay called a Kirby Bauer assay, where you grow up an overnight culture of the bacteria and you just inoculate with a cotton swab all the way across the plate so that the bacteria will grow up in this confluent lawn where there are no gaps on the plate. And then what you do is you drop these little filter paper discs that contain different doses of different antibiotics onto the plate, incubate them overnight, and then you look to see if the antibiotic inhibited the growth of the bacteria, right, as the antibiotic diffused out of the disc was where the bacteria killed or inhibited in their growth, or did the bacteria completely ignore the presence of the antibiotic and grow all the way up to the disc and sometimes even on top of it, right? And then you just get out your ruler, you measure these diameters, um, compare them to a table and score the bacteria as sensitive or resistant to the antibiotic. And so Anna did this for four of the bacteria from our culture collection. Um, 
and she tested them against all of these antibiotics, vancomycin, ciprofloxacin, sulfa and trimethoprim, novobiosin, tetracycline, streptomycin, chloramphenicol, and I think uh, bacitracin. And what she found was that all four of these isolates were resistant to four of the antibiotics that we tested. They were sensitive to four, but they were resistant to half of the antibiotics we tested. If you look up the mechanism of action, the targets of these antibiotics, these represent a number of different resistance and mechanisms. And so this was uh, interesting, right? And kind of something we hadn't expected to see. But it's not surprising that soil bacteria, you know, would have antimicrobial resistance, right? These are essentially a chemical defense system. They're not, you know, making... And so they're engaged in chemical warfare all the time in the soils. And so uh, upon reflection, it was you know, a neat finding, but perhaps not totally surprising. Okay. And then other follow-up work on the work that uh, the undergrads have been doing. I have a graduate student in the ecotoxicology program, Amelia Berga, and she's picked up uh, 10 of these um, Acinetobacter isolates to work with for her thesis project and so she's been doing some more of the quantitative assessment of growth on these PAHs and so here she grew uh, four of these isolates isolate 505, 514, 530 and 527 on uh, different PAHs so on naphthalene in this uh, pink on phenanthrene which is a three ring PAH in uh, this, I don't know, greeny blue color. And then on biphenyl, which isn't strictly speaking a PAH, but it's often um, metabolized by pH degraders. And so these four bacteria that she looked at, they're all acinetobacters. Their 16S sequences are highly similar. But what we see when we do the phenotypic um, uh, you know, analysis, look at their growth, even though they're very closely related when we look just at the 16S, they have very different preferences in terms of their growth and their ultimate growth yield on uh, these PAHs. And so 16S isn't everything, which is something we always have to remind ourselves of when we talk about the bacteria. Okay. Uh, Amelia was also interested in testing the surface properties of these uh, bacteria. If you remember from you know, microbiology class, like that my bacterial cells have they're coated essentially with a negative charge. And so accessing um, these hydrophobic PAHs is a challenge, right? They shouldn't be able to get at them to metabolize them. Um, and so one way that uh, bacteria can access these is by changing their surface properties or by producing surfactants. And so Amelia did this emulsification assay with uh, her collection or her selection of isolates where you grow up these cultures overnight, and then you mix them with hexadecane as a test hydrocarbon. And you look at the degree of emulsification that, um, that occurs. And so she saw you know, the emulsification percentage here is depicted for these 10 isolates. And we see that one of them, this 505 strain that grew really well on phenanthrene, also um, is, does really well in this emulsification test, perhaps explaining or helping to explain how well it uh, can grow on or degrade these hydrocarbons. Okay, so in terms of the story so far for the uh, culture collection and the uh, and the uh, isolates so far in the undergraduate class, we've isolated 160. Uh, isolates, bacterial isolates, 137 of them are naphthalene degraders. Some of the isolates seem to lose the ability to degrade naphthalene over time or never had it. A lot of these genes are born on plasmids, which if you don't keep the organism under continual selective pressure, they get lazy and they just don't bother keeping the plasmid around anymore. Right? But we detected the PHE degradation gene in about 50% of the isolates. Collection was dominated by these acinetobacters, these emerging gram negative pathogens. Not a lot in the literature about them degrading PAHs. There is information in the literature about this one, uh, uh, acinetobacter oleivorans, which uh, 
degrades diesel and alkanes, so aliphatic hydrocarbons. We found that ours were resistant to multiple antibiotics. And Amelia's work shows that they grow, their isolates can grow on a variety of PAHs. And in fact, that some of them prefer PAHs other than the naphthalene we use to, to isolate the bacteria. We also found some of the more classical pH degrading bacteria, Burkholderia and Pseudomonads, and just a few gram positives. And so there are some well-known pH degrading gram positive bacteria, members of the mycobacteria, rhodococci, and so on. But the media that we use in the lab for our initial enrichments was originally designed for Pseudomonas, which is a gram negative. So it's not surprising that the gram positives who are a little bit fussier um, aren't showing up in our, uh, in our isolations. Okay, so every fall, we isolate a bunch of naphthalene degrading bacteria. And every spring, I try to convince my students to continue their adventures in microbiology by taking a follow-up course in experimental bacterial genomics. And so in this class, we spend the first six or seven weeks learning basic molecular biology techniques, PCR, reverse transcription PCR, cloning, protein expression, and a little bit more in-depth sequence analysis than they do when they make trees and do blast searches of their 16S sequences in, in 314. And then the last eight or nine or 10 weeks of the semester, the students carry out independent research projects. So in the first class, they're following my plan. It's a guided research project. We don't know what we're gonna find, but there's a map. This class, for six weeks, I'm driving the bus. And then the last you know, eight, nine weeks of class, the students are in charge. I tell them what resources they have available to them. And their job is to design a project to identify the pH degradation genes that are um, allowing these bacteria to grow on naphthalene to produce that um, indigo. And so, this semester, it's super exciting for me because this year, for the first time, we actually have genome sequences for these bacteria. And so my uh, colleague, uh, Lauren Lownan, a good friend of mine who's at Keene State College in New Hampshire, she uh, has a project where she was able to sequence 20 genomes for us for, for my class. And so our uh, we're at the point of the semester where we've done the preliminary assembly and basic kind of automated annotation of these genomes. We picked, you know, a number of Vaccinetobacters to look at. We picked a Pseudomonas and a Burkholderia because they're the well-known pH degraders. We put in a token gram positive because, you know, I wanted it. And then lastly, last semester, we isolated a bunch of pink bacteria, which turned out to do absolutely nothing to naphthalene, but they were really, really pretty. And so usually bacteria, you know, when you grow them on a plate, like it hurts me to say it, but they're kind of boring looking. They're, you know, white or cream or somewhere in between those two exciting colors. And so the pink bacteria, I was like, I love the color pink. It reminds me of the azaleas in bloom. We're going to work with a few of these as well. And so we sequenced uh, the genomes of two pink bacteria, and they turned out to be Serratia marcescens. And uh, it's an interesting one to look at anyway, because it produces a lot of cool secondary metabolites. They're often the pigment is the bioactive molecule. And so we're going to have some fun with this one as well. So we've got some basic sequencing metrics here. Our preliminary scan through them has found, you know, pH degradation gene candidates in all of the degradation, pH degrading bacteria. Not shockingly, we didn't find them in the beautiful pink one that didn't grow on the pHs in our hands. And also over here, this column just tells us about screening for the presence of antibiotic resistance genes. And we found evidence of antibiotic resistance genes in all of these bacteria. And so it's, you know, mid-semester. So right now, students have, 
We've gotten the genome sequence. They've done the assembly and annotation. They've done their first kind of preliminary superficial look for pH degradation genes. When we come back after break, they're going to do some more bioinformatics, design their project, and hopefully find and verify the function of these pH degradation genes. And um, kind of the payoff for me in setting these, this, you know, kind of year long in class project is that um, these, the information that we're generating through, I, through getting these isolates and um, learning, you know, identifying the genes that are catalyzing degradation of these pHs is that it allows us to develop tools, things like primers and probes that we can use in culture independent analysis of, of microbial hydrocarbon degradation, right? Um, microbial ecology, right? in the 21st century is all about generating large data sets, whether they be, um, and but you need some knowledge from cultured bacteria to know what all that sequence you got is, right? And so I'll check my watch here for a minute and uh, talk a little bit about where this would go in terms of the research, some of the research that we do, that the graduate students in my lab do. And so um, in molecular microbial ecology, right, beginning in the 1990s when PCR became you know, available and sequencing began, DNA sequencing began to take off, we switched from say isolate and black box assessments of microbial activity to these sequence-based assessments where you could go out, collect a liter of water or 10 or hundred liters of water, filter it, isolate the genomic DNA of all the microbes in that sample and do things like use primers to the 16S ribosomal RNA gene to generate a pool of sequence fragments that represented the diversity of that community. And so back when people were first doing this work, right, if you had a data set that had a hundred sequences in it, you had done a lot of work, right? That was a robust data set. Now, you know, we're in 2022, we're in the era of next generation sequencing technologies. We've got these instruments that generate hundreds of millions of sequence reads in, um, in a run, right? which gives us a much deeper picture of what's happening in these environments of who's there and what they're doing. We can go from this approach where we just look at a limited number of sequences from one gene to doing really in-depth 16S analyses of microbial communities, or we can take this genomic DNA and we can sequence it directly, sequence all of the genes from all of the microbes and see what they're doing. And, um, and this is a really important thing to do because while the culture type work that we're doing in my in my undergraduate class is really important. What we learned, we learned when we first started doing these DNA sequence-based uh, surveys of, uh, of different environments, we learned that we get information from culture-based studies, but that information is often incomplete. And so this is one of a series of paper, data from one of a series of papers that were published in the mid to late 1990s that looked at the discrepancy between our picture of microbial diversity when we used culture-based approaches to understand what kind of bacteria and so on were present in an environment and when we used sequence-based approaches. And so this work was done, it's not marine work, it was done with I think soils from uh, Arizona, but these uh, the authors of the study went out, they collected soils from a number of environments and they used a variety of different media, did their best to grow as many different bacteria as they could from those samples. And then they sequenced the 16S ribosomal RNA gene from you know, representatives of these groups. And when they did this with the bacteria they grew up, they came up with this answer that the soil microbial community was You've got the bacterial phyla or divisions here on the x-axis, but the culture-based approach told them the soils were 
communities were comprised of 80% gram positive bacteria, 20 ish percent proteobacteria, and there might have been one of these Cytophaga flexibacteria in their collection. When they took those same soils and they just extracted the DNA, amplified the 16S ribosomal RNA gene, and categorized the, the microbial community using these molecular sequence based tools, they got a very different picture, right? Where the gram positives really decreased in, uh, their, in their estimates, proteobacteria decreased as well. And uh, this group, uh, the acidobacteria, turned out to account for about 50% of the soil microbial communities. Uh, and there wasn't a sniff of them in the culture collection. And this is very similar to what we saw when we started doing these analyses in marine microbial communities and people described the star 11 cluster, which can account for a you know, 25 to 50% of the microbial cells in some marine habitats. And so these um, sequence-based approaches are really important, but, but I, I would argue we still need some culture work so that as we move into this deep sequencing, or we're sequencing everything, we still need to be able to identify what we see at the end. And so I think the work that the undergrads in my classes are doing really complements kind of the work of say, looking at hydrocarbon degradation in marine environments in that it can, they can provide the tools to winnow through all that information that we can get from, um, from uh, uh, the, the metagenomic sequencing and so on. And so I think I'm going to skip a few slides now at the end and not talk about Bobby's uh, work here and just skip ahead to kind of my take home message, if you will. And I think that's, you know, students can do real good, really good, authentic, valuable research in undergraduate courses. I think one of the big advantages to these course-based undergraduate research experiences is that these courses expose students who haven't previously considered research to a real research experience. Um, they don't have to gather up the courage to go knock on a professor's door and ask if they can they have room in their lab. It's a much more equitable way to bring the entire kind of biology undergraduate population into an authentic research experience. It means students who say are working and don't have time to make a commitment to doing research, you know, outside of classwork can get a, a real research experience as just as a normal part of their coursework. In terms of the science of what they found, we found, right? We found the acinetobacters dominated our collection, antimicrobial resistance was common in the soil bacteria. And kind of looking forward, if I can, you know, find time in my day and talk my chair into it. I think the next step is to develop a microbiome or metagenomics type cure course to see if I can really create a cult of Shanae then get students to take me for three semesters in a row. <laughs> they could just have a minor in Dr. Nikhine. And so as part of that, I've actually kind of plugged in with this REMNET Research Coordination Network, which um, it's an NSF funded endeavor to bring microbiome science into the undergraduate curriculum. And there are people in this network who are actually doing microbiome type lab courses in freshman biology classes. And that would be the dream. Because in some ways, doing these you know, research intensive courses, I teach juniors and seniors. You know, we've already lost half our biology majors at the end of the first year. And so if we could get something like this into the first year curriculum at South, I think it would be really valuable. Um, in terms of acknowledgements, my uh, biology 314 and 414 students, and then the brave souls who after taking one or two classes with me came back to do independent studies in the lab as well. Sam Brown, Lisa Leatherwood, Caroline Jordan, Christian Ballinger and Anna Foster. My graduate students, I skipped over Bobby's work, but uh, uh, showed you some of Amelia's work. Uh, Jeremiah and Angela for sharing the analysis of uh, the, the uh, biology department, uh, the biology student population. 
my friend Lauren, who, you know, managed to sequence 20 genomes for me for zero dollars, which is exactly the budget that we had for it. Um, some of this work uh, in developing these courses initially was funded by a grant from the National Science Foundation that myself, Tim Sherman, Ashley Morris and Rob Gray had shortly after I first arrived at South. Bobby's work was funded by BP and the Northern Gulf Institute. And then I have to just acknowledge, you know, my colleagues in the biology department in general who are just very supportive and didn't judge me when I, you know, made all my students buy lab coats and, <laughs> you know, dress like scientists to do microbiology. And I'll just finish with, you know, kind of some of the feedback from the students uh, who I think I give them a survey both at the beginning of the semester and at the end of the semester, asking them if they've ever considered doing research and so on. And um, it's always interesting to see how many students there were like, you know, research, it's not for me. I just want to get my degree and go to PT school or I'm here to go to PA school but that they end up really enjoying the kind of discovery aspect of, uh, of this experience. And I think I'll stop talking there and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. I didn't put any of the negative comments up. <laughs> So luckily in microbiology, there are a lot of really good uh, videos already out there to demonstrate the techniques. And so I was really busy during fall of 2020 and spring of 2021 because both of those semesters um, I taught the class in person, but I gave my students the option to, um, to be virtual, either virtual for lecture and in-person in lab or any kind of combination that worked. And so basically while my in-person students were doing this project, I was kind of generating novel data for my virtual students as well. And so I coupled that with, there's a really nice uh, series of, um, microbiology techniques videos that they were able to watch the techniques. I didn't film myself doing it because, well, I couldn't do it and film myself well at the same time. But so they kind of watched the techniques and then they got authentic, real novel data that I just generated during lab while my students were doing the work. And it worked. Like two of the students that, you know, did follow-up independent studies um, were students who took the lab virtually. I had never seen them until they, you know, showed up at my office the first day of the following semester or two semesters later in one case um, to, to do some, to do research in the lab based on the class. So it was suboptimal, but I think it worked. We have a question online from uh, Blair Morrison, who, uh, of course, excellent presentation, and thank you very much. Uh, she's uh, asked, you know, what was the overall geographic niche uh, diversity of the samples collected for the courses? Um, and then follows up that uh, with, does the functionality of naphthalene de degradation vary across microbial niches? And then there's another part of the question, but I'll do that first part. So um, the last, so um, it depends, like, the first few years I had students bring samples from wherever. I suspect some of their soil samples were collected right outside the life sciences building when they went, oops, I forgot that she told us to bring soil to class today. <laughs> um, also, uh, some of them have come from my flower bed. Some of them, there are still a few creosote treated utility poles around town. And so whenever I spot one of those, uh, I quickly put on my turn signal and pull over and grab some of that soil because you would think those, that soil should be primed and give us a uh, better 
kind of return on a investment in our search for pH degrading bacteria. But the reality is that my experience has been that is it a fast pecking who says, you know, everything is everywhere and the environment selects, no matter what samples we, we've uh, brought in, that have been brought into lab, we, we, we find these pH degraders everywhere. Um, and so um, the, um, the, the, the ability seems to be widespread and certainly Bobby's work, which I didn't present, but for his thesis, he had done a series of um, enrichment experiments using sediments from Point of Pines after the, the, um, the oil spill. And he had um, enriched them, supplemented them with different things, with like, dispersant, with nutrients, with a supplementary like carbon source or co-metabolite. And what he found was no matter what bottle we looked at, everything but the killed control degraded the oil. But when we did this, we did 16S uh, NGS sequencing, the bacteria doing the work varied widely, wildly depending on what we had added to the bottles. Different communities were selected, but it didn't seem like the oil was only partially driving the selection and whatever, whatever amendment, whether it was nutrients, whether it was carbon or so on, seemed to be just as important. And so there seems to be huge functional resiliency. And a lot of these genes are on mobile genetic elements. They're passed among bacteria. And so it's not surprising, I think, that you would see that. So there was a lot of structural diversity, but functional similarity. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. When we did, you know, like multidimensional scaling, looking at the community, we had, you know, circles everywhere with different groups, but they all did the same work in the end. Uh, Blair further asks, um, uh, as you mentioned, many bacterial species aren't easily culturable using traditional microbiology techniques. Do you envision being able to incorporate more metabolomics or proteomic approaches to your undergrad courses? Um, you know, let's just say that President Bonner is going to have to like get some massive donations before we can do that kind of work in my undergraduate course. Um, unfortunately, that kind of work is still quite expensive. Um, I do have some friends down at the Mitchell Cancer Institute who do proteomics and so on. And, you know, if I can get the microbiome course up and running, it would be nice to do like not just the environment, the, the metagenomic sequencing, but if we could do some proteomics or something, you know, with, with someone's leftover reagents, that's the reality of, you know, of, uh, of the budget for these classes. Cost has come down for a lot of things, but we're kind of limited. That would be the dream, right? But you know, somebody needs to endow a you know Sinead's lab fund. Yeah, uh, I don't know. Uh, we have another question uh, online. Is, is there any in-person questions? I... All right. Uh, Will Ballantyne asks: uh, The first research experience for an undergraduate student can be very important for landing your next research position. I agree. How can students who take your courses? document their experiences on CVs or resumes in a way that illustrates that they participated in productive research? So that's a really good question. And the way I handle this right now is at the end, I have a wrap up email that I send at the end of the semester to all of my students in which I remind them of everything that they've learned this semester and how they should you know, put it on their CV. And I tell them, you know, if you passed the class, <laughs> You know, you should feel free to list me as a reference when you apply for jobs. And so I just, I, I, one of the things I've learned is that I'm apparently really, really scary. And so, <laughs> and so, and so like I, what I've learned is like you, I ha you have to, most of our students, you have to tell them that these are okay things to do. And so I tell them, use me as a reference. Here are the things you learned. You know, if you're applying for a job, tell me so that I know that somebody's going to call me and I can, you know, have, you know, your, your information ready to go. Um, and so for the classes, it's a little, it's tricky if you don't do that kind of, kind of, if you're not as an instructor, I think, proactive and tell the students, here's how to kind of report this. For the independent research, 
they can do independent research at South either for credit where it shows up on their transcript, but we also now have zero credit where they don't have to pay for the privilege of working for nothing in your lab. So we have these zero hour research classes where you get on your trans, I have these courses that are just under, you know, research in microbiology. And so they get transcript credit if they do research in my lab, even if they're not taking it for, for credit. And it just shows up as pass fail and it just shows up as having done research. And so that's uh, Christy West, our, dec our undergraduate research director at South. She put that in place three or four years ago. And it's been fantastic because in some ways, you know, um, it feels almost wrong to charge students money to come to your lab and do research that you benefit from. I mean, they benefit too. There's total value to it, but it feels a little, to me, it always felt a little kind of icky, especially when the university doesn't give you any credit on your kind of workload effort for doing this directed studies mentoring. So I really like having my students, you know, do research for transcript credit without giving South hundreds and hundreds of dollars. The dean and my chair may feel differently, but. Do you have any other questions? Well, thank you for coming. We appreciate it. And uh, one more round of applause. Still some more refreshments in the back. Uh, and of course, if you have any questions, uh, um, Sinead will be here a few more hours this afternoon.